You mentioned at the end that not all students agreed that it was a positive experience. Could you share a couple of the critical points and if there was any uh, valuable feedback from their critical perspective? Yeah, I, the, the biggest complaint, and I'd have my colleagues jump in, is that the work is too much. And there are too many assignments, and it's a little overwhelming. So what we've tried to do is go back and look at the assignments, monitor them, and we try to cut back, okay, and make sure they were more meaningful. Only 1.8% of the students out of the 1,000 said this was a poor course or a waste of time. Only 1.8%. But we did learn, and that's, uh, Steve, uh, yeah. Rick, anything? Just Um, they can't memorize their way through the course. I begin my lecture by saying I wouldn't have done this well, that well in this course, because I always did everything at the last minute when I was in college. You know, that's maybe why I became a journalist, but, um, <laughs> you know, they have to work at it all semester long. It requires a lot, and it's different than most other courses uh, that they've taken, a lot of freshmen. But, Anyway, we're very open to the feedback from them, and, and, we ch and like Howie said, we change it you know, all the time. Other questions? Well, I hear more. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, would you elaborate on how you believe literacy is different from criticism? Right. Well, li criticism is not, it seems to me that criticism is a, a judge of the quality, perhaps, of something, right? We're looking at the qualitative. This is really a, a, a judgment on the reliability, not the, not the quali quali qualitative aspects of a work. So if I'm a critic, I'm looking at, seems to me, is it authoritative and is it qualitative and is it done well and what are the values, its production values, et cetera. This is very much about reliability. And I think that's different. It's about action rather than the aesthetic nature or the qualitative nature of a work. I hope that answers your question. And I don't know if anybody wants to add anything. OK, over here. Uh uh, to what extent do you examine uh, non-mainstream news, especially Spanish language or other ethnic uh, news media? We don't do it much, and we probably need to do more of it. Um, we, we more and more are sending them to a range of sites, so we want them to certainly expose themselves to some non-traditional sites. We have not done much in this area, and it's something we need to think about. And in the next day or two, it would be great to get some ideas of how we can incorporate that. You know, one of the things, people said you have 42 hours to do this, 14 weeks. Wow, you have all the time in the world. We always feel that we need more time in this. So we got to figure it out. Wait a second. Yeah, over, wait for microphone, please. A particular comment on that is that uh, uh, this is a particularly good opportunity to work with uh, foreign language students, ESL students in these secondary schools. Uh, what news literacy does is take those same skills and apply it not only to English language news, but to, uh, foreign, to foreign papers as well. And so you're getting an ideal way of teaching real skills while at the same time a new language to many of our youngsters who are in dire need of that. Steve is one of our high school, uh, uh, high school coordinator. The one thing we do try to do, and this is not the same, is have students look at foreign news sources and American sources on the same story to see the difference in perspective. That's a different issue, but we want them to recognize that there's media outside the country and what their perspective is on the same story that we're doing. Here we go, right over here. Jenny? Could you describe the writing assignments? What, what kinds of things are students doing besides taking, I guess, short answering? Or what performance do you ask for from them? OK, this is not a writing course. And although some people at the university have suggested, since all the students at the university have to take writing, that this should be an extension. So we give a series of assignments in the week. Jenny, I would say <laughs> students write between 250, 400 words. This is not short answers. So they'll do an essay on the blackout experience, for example. They'll go on Project Implicit and say, you took a bias test, what did you take, what happened, and what was your reaction, and describe it. We will have them go into a news log and say, we want you to take a story that's a news story and an opinion story about the same subject. We want you to analyze the two stories and tell us what you see, what are the differences 
in those two stories. And we'll say write 300 words. So we're not, except for that essay at the end of the semester, which is a culminating experience, it's 400 words, 500 words, 300 words. It's not short answers. Okay, in fact, they want more space for these assignments. One of the big complaints, you're not giving us enough room. Why do we want to do it in 250 words? And we tell them, we want you to synthesize this. We want you to think harder. We want you to really boil down things to its essence. We don't want, what? And use examples. And use examples, always. Examples, examples, examples. Back up your arguments. Not how they feel, but what they Right. Mm. It's hard. Howie? Yes. Uh, have you given any consideration to offering a course like this to the general public? Um, yes. Um, we've been thinking about it because wherever we go and talk about the course, people say, where can I take it? I was in one of our, we have something here called the round table for retired people, and I went in and, I, and they all said, where can we take the course? So Ford, as part of their grant, has asked us to see if we could do a series of public forums in which we do lectures for the general public. The real issue is, is that the best way to deliver it? How would we deliver it? We're also working with Pointer, you're gonna hear more about this, on developing an online course for the general public. We've done the first one, three hours, on how to be a smart TV news consumer. We're gonna unveil that tomorrow. So I don't know if that's one of the ways we should do it. But yes, there, there's a lot of interest. One question here. Go ahead, Lorraine. Oh, hi, Howard. What are you doing about the coverage of issues of diversity, misrepresentation of minorities in news, how one of the big issues for, prime, for mainstream news organizations is the complaint by lots of people that they don't do a good job of that. And it seems to me, if you're talking about news literacy, part of what you need to be teaching is how that should be handled and have people look at those issues as they talk about this. I think that's a really good point. We do it. In, when we talk about fairness and bias, we talk about whether the news media is covering everything the way it's supposed to and what we miss by omission. But I'm not sure we spend enough time. And we deal with racial and gender stereotypes in news stories when they come up and we talk to the students about them. But I think we need to do more. I think we do more. Yes. Howie, to follow up on the notion of a course for the public, it's me in the red jacket back here. Oh, Charlotte, Charlotte, Charlotte. <laughs> okay. Uh, have you thought about doing anything with faculty across campus? Because I seem to find that a lot of our faculty know as little or even less than our students do about news literacy. That's a good point. And, and you know, one of the things I hope we're going to come away with in the next two days are some ideas for action plans about what you can do and what we can do collectively to take this kind of information and spread it. We went to, Marcy and I went to see the president, was it NBC, where's Marcy? NBC. We went to see NBC and we said, you know, we're doing this, maybe NBC would like to get involved and support us, and at the end he said, I think I'd like my staff to take the course. So, <laughs> you know, there's lots of people I think, although we would have to adapt it, and I think there are some gaps that you have properly identified in the curriculum, but there are lots of ways and lots of audiences, I think, for this course, absolutely, or this material. Right here, Howie. Yes, um, I'm wondering whether uh, you consider as part of news literacy examining the business of, of news. I mean, who owns Fox, how the, uh, the financial crisis facing newspapers maybe is affecting the way they cover things. It's interesting you say that because we added an entire lecture on this subject. And I'm going to ask Rick, who basically developed that lecture, to talk about what we're trying to do. So we have a whole lecture on who owns the media, does it make a difference, why you should care as a consumer. Yeah, I mean, the, the bottom line of it is that, uh, you know, we, the, we look at, especially in the United States, we have this strange combination of a public servant that requires profit. And we've been based on a model that was developed in like 1830, and now it's broken. And what's gonna happen? And we, we don't know, I mean, no one knows. But we do, we, we have a whole lecture trying to get them to think about it, and also make them aware of how this impacts the news that they are receiving. Why, you know, maybe it's you know, becoming less targeted, more, uh, or more targeted, more narrow cast, you know, less broad based, and the impact of that. 